Warning, the following podcast contains violent scenes that may be unsettling to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. In 1999, the walls of hell cracked, and fallen angels condemned to an eternity in the abyss were suddenly able to flee. With no choice but to come to terms with the decaying remnants of the paradise they helped create, these escaped fallen must now decide whether they will rebuild their masterpiece or burn it to a cinder. Hello and welcome to Demon the Fallen, Fragments a Demon the Fallen game set in Rochester, New York, in the year 2001. This story features the character of Azoth, played by Tillman, Arakel, played by Rebecca, Brawlman, played by Adam, and Abathar, played by Slavic. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can find us on Twitter at twin underscore cities underscore VTM, on Facebook at Twin Cities by Night, and on Discord at Twin Cities by Night. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the current installment of Demon the Fallen Fragments, where we last left our intrepid possible heroes. They were leaving the Sojourner house and heading their separate ways. We now catch up with our characters as they enter their own private domiciles. We will begin with Esme. Esme returns to her apartment, lets herself in. It is oddly quiet. The day has been long, and the toll that that length has taken on the body she now inhabits is starting to become very apparent. There is a fatigue and exhaustion that very rapidly sets in despite her angelic vitality. What does Esme do? Esme will begin to make a very small dinner, likely extremely basic. She decides on a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then To make it a little bit warm after such a long day, she's actually going to grill it on her stovetop. She just kind of, it's it's all very robotic. She goes and she takes the pieces of bread and she makes up the sandwich and she's just standing over it, looking at it as it's cooking and not doing anything else. Like she's almost on autopilot at this point. And after the 10 minutes it takes to do that, she'll sit down and she'll eat it. Nothing else going on, no sensory stuff. She's just sitting there thinking about the day, letting it all kind of wash over her. Well, again, robotic and mindless as she's going about these tasks. As she's sitting there, you know, just quietly munching on her grilled peanut butter and jelly, she starts getting that strange sensation that indicates that there are supernatural powers being used within the area that she can sense. And it's little pops and fizzles of energy that she can feel. And there's a flurry of it at one point for about 15 minutes. And then it sort of trickles off. And then most of the remainder of the evening is fairly calm. Off in the distance, she hears a couple of gunshots followed by sirens about 10 minutes later. At one point she looks over and sees the door to the bathroom and the memory of waking up in the bathtub comes back. The door is brand new naturally but it doesn't strip away the memory. I'll definitely consider the space out at the bathroom for a while. And then again, just autopilot body starts to move and starts doing stuff. She'll probably sit down in her room and work on like those little kits that you get for kids where to get them interested in science. And she's, you know, just something real basic that she can do with her hands before just trying to wind down. And then it occurs to her at some point, She hasn't seen her roommate in a while. That's a very good point. No, she has not. So, yeah, Esme will actually get up and go to the phone and give her a call just because it it seems to be even getting even later. And she has that expectation of, my roommate, it's at nighttime, my roommate should be home, where is she? As the phone rings on the other end, Esme sort of absentmindedly walks towards her roommate's room. The door is open, and Esme looks in and sees a number of clothing items scattered on the bed and on the floor. Dresser drawers are open. It looks like some cosmetics are missing. Her duffel bag is no longer at the foot of the bed like it usually was. And no one answers the phone. It eventually goes to voicemail. Hey, it's Esme. Just seeing where you're at. And then click. It, it becomes clear to her that she's either spending the night. I think it's a weekend, so that's not super unusual. But... 
Esme has a bit of sadness because she was kind of hoping to have that more personal connection with her roommate. And yeah, just the, the rest of the evening, maybe for an hour more, Esme will sit down and work on the robot and think about all the stuff that's happened today and just like that's her way of processing it is by doing something with her hands, trying to unwind, and eventually she'll just get ready and go to bed. As she's wandering around unwinding, she sees bits and pieces of plaster on the floor and memories come back of fights with the boyfriend being pushed into the wall hard enough for an elbow to go through the sheetrock, the door being hit hard enough to split and crack the plywood. Oh shit, man. She's starting to feel uncomfortable and doesn't want to be alone tonight. These memories start filtering into Esme or to Erikel's mind from Esme's of just how poorly she was treated. Uh, Memories of a bloody nose, memories of bruises on ribs, and just how much that broke Esme and why she ended up in the state that allowed her to become Eric Hell's vessel. Eric Hell really doesn't know how to handle that or really process it. Because this happened, oh yeah, that happened about two years ago. It's a bit of a shift for Eric Hell. You know, going from an omnip- near omnipotent celestial being capable of ruining nations to feeling so small and so broken. The dichotomy is just a little overwhelming, I think. It's that feeling of helplessness or knowing I'm so vulnerable in this vessel that and anger and just general uncomfortableness. Like she almost doesn't want to be in this skin anymore, but there's not any other option as far as she's aware of. And unless she wants to go back to hell, and that is not something she wants to do. Yeah, it's funny Uh, you should mention hell. Is it? It is. (laughs) To, in a weird sort of way, thinking of hell and everything that went on there, the constant torment and backbiting and fighting and the more potent fallen, ripping apart the few rare human souls that would filter in. You know, Eriquel kind of gets this impression of Esme feeling how one of those souls may have felt to some extent. And Eriquel, it's hard for her to really piece together every memory from the time spent in the void. But Eriquel can't help but wonder if at some point she did that to a human soul. And that, you know, that must open up a whole new can of worms for her. Yeah, she's she has this line of reasoning where it's gone from the what's physically around her and focusing on that and the things that have happened today to making those steps and connections between, you know, how how did Esme feel in real life versus before she passed away to hell and those souls and there's just there's some rage and uncomfortableness being in this body for Arquil herself. And now she's feeling a, a mesh of guilt and some, some confusion and confliction. And it's all just, all these emotions start to swirl in her. And again, it's, she really just doesn't know how to deal with it because before all of this, there wasn't any, any kind of emotion. Like she had a certainty. She knew what she was doing. The steps that she was taking in life might've been slow, but there was, a process to it and now there's not and that's just it it's leaving her to her in an emotional mess and as eric hell eventually makes her way to esme's bedroom it just gets a little bit worse opening the door she sees reminders of esme's boyfriend gifts that he had given her some were apologetic some were quite possibly genuine generosity but a few of them are there invisible sitting on top of the dresser hanging from the wall a necklace a painting a few sets of earrings the bed is a little tussled it's been a while since Eriquel's bothered to make it as she goes to pick up something that was on the desk and staring at it a surge of rage just 
comes through her and she chucks it at the wall. And she starts to target those specific items from the boyfriend, just mad that she even has them, that they're a reminder that it's this place is a reminder of that life and she's just having all this rage and emotion. She has to take it out on something. And so she'll rip posters, she'll break the painting and her room, which is normally kept in everything has its spot, just becomes completely self shoveled as she's making quite a racket for her neighbors. Yep. And at, at one point she does hear a thumping from above as someone is stomping on the floor yelling, shut up! Fuck off! And top of the lungs, just screaming and rage. She's shaking so hard because she's just that upset at everything. And once that kind of dissipates, she crumples on the ground and she just starts crying. There's, there's no rage to be had at this point as all the items are broken and... There's nothing but sadness at this point. And we will leave Eriquel on her bedroom floor, surrounded by the broken pieces of what few reminders exist of Esme's relationship with the person who ultimately drove her to suicide. And with that, we will turn to Oliver. Oliver pulls his Audi into his garage, parks it, and heads towards his... uh, his abode. Tell us about Oliver's home. That's a good question, actually. Uh, I'm not sure what we established when Tizania visited. Did he have an apartment, or was it actually like a house? That's a very good question. I remember it being fairly well-appointed and luxurious. I think it was a house in the suburbs. I mean, possibly. Though with resources for he could easily have multiple I'm homes. tempted to say it's some kind of loft all right, we'll roll with that. Because he shut the door on Tizania, and I mean, it didn't uh, feel to me like it was a house at that point. Okay. So I'd say uh, it's a fairly nice loft, you know, with a good view of the city. Mm. He probably got takeaway food when he came home. And I would say his, he has a lot of very white furniture and like glossy white cupboards and kitchen uh, stuff. It kind of looks a bit tacky, probably. But that's uh, what Oliver chose. He has the money, but he doesn't really have any sense of style. And he never established it or uh, ever cared to. So he doesn't even mingle with the kind of people who would be able to help him out or maybe uh, give him good suggestions. One thing that Oliver notices as he enters his loft is a pile of mail on the floor behind the door on the other side of the mail slot. Yeah, he picks it up routinely and brings everything to the kitchen area, food and mail, and just browses through it. There's the standard assortment of junk mail, bills. uh, Oh yeah, bills are junk. Yeah, (laughs) newspaper flyers. There are two things that really stand out, though. There's a very official-looking letter from a law firm known as Dwyer & Lang. There's also a letter that is hand-addressed to Oliver. That's probably fan mail. He's going to look at the lawyer stuff first. He, uh, I would say, like the Oliver side of Azov and Oliver kind of tenses uh, up a little bit because that looks bad. I don't think Oliver ever had any deep understanding of law. I mean, he does have the basics, how to get a product on the market, but... You know, so you could easily get into trouble because there are like weird regulations about safety concerns that he doesn't know anything about. He opens up the letter and the realization comes to him that Dwyer and Lang is the law firm that he uses for his own needs. They're his attorneys. And inside there is a stack of paperwork and a nicely typed cover letter indicating that Oliver is being sued. He is named in a lawsuit that is being brought as a personal injury lawsuit as a result of a number of his clientele suffering liver and kidney damage, allegedly as the result of using the products that Oliver has sold between the years of 1996 and 2000. They are seeking approximately $1.8 million in damages, in addition to compensation for all of the medical bills, which total about another $1.2 million. 
Um, Oliver is going to quickly set that to the side and open the other letter. The other letter is a gushing fan letter about how amazing and wonderful Oliver is and how much the writer is so grateful that Oliver was able to cure his cancer and save his life. And at the bottom, it is signed with a trooper's name. Ah, that is the Canadian policeman. Yes. That we had in the prelude. Yes. At this point, Azov kind of shrinks into himself because now he knows he maybe showed too much of his powers. Um, but it's probably a good thing that uh, the this policeman just thinks that he's some kind of wondrous healer and that uh, it's all connected to the products that Oliver is selling. There is the question, though. How did he get Oliver's personal address? That is a good question. But, um, I mean, I would probably think that he recalled the the car tag and was able to uh, deduce who it was registered to. And also, this man was buying the the products that Oliver is selling, probably not uh, through his own address, but the company at least. And pulling some strings, he probably found out the home address. Okay. I, wouldn't, I would think he probably isn't even the first one to do so. I mean, Oliver is pretty famous in the scene. No, he is. Speaking of which, a quick glance at the kitchen counter and Azoth realizes that the answering machine light is blinking. Yeah, he hits the button. Hey, boss, this is uh, Gus down here at the distribution. Look, we got uh, we got some guys poking around. I, they want to check labels and weigh stuff and take samples. I don't know what you want me to do. I'm trying to get rid of them, but they're being pretty insistent. If you could give me a call, it's uh, it's about 8 in the morning, 8.30 in the morning. Not sure what's going on, but uh, I thought you might want to know about it. Click. Hey, boss. Yeah, it's Gus again. Uh, you know, it's it's about lunchtime. Those guys, they took a, about a case of product. They said that they had the right to. They had some official-looking paperwork. I... <sighs> I don't know, maybe we should talk to the lawyers or something. This seems kind of shady to me. I'm pretty sure one of them had a gun. I was kind of nervous. But if you could give me a call back, that'd be great. Click. Hey, Oliver, it's Candy. I really enjoyed our date last week. Do me a favor and give me a call back as soon as you can, okay? Thanks. Click. Oliver, it's your mother. Why haven't you called me? It's been like a year. What kind of terrible son are you? Call your mother. Click. Hey, boss. It's Gus again. Um, yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna shut down for the day. It's like three in the afternoon. I know we're closing early. There's still some orders that need to go out, but uh, I'm getting a little worried. There's there's this guy in the parking lot who just keeps staring at the business, and I'm not sure what the deal is. But I'm 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 taking everyone home. I'm gonna lock up after I leave. Uh, if the alarm goes off, it's probably that guy. I got him on the security cameras, so we'll we'll see in the morning, I guess. Click, and that's the last of the messages. I think Azov is gonna kind of crash on one of his tacky couches along those lines, at least, and um, munch on his food that has probably gotten a little cold. And just think to himself, like, what the fuck? How does all of this work? There are a lot of moving wheels to Oliver's life. Between dodging various legal actions and keeping his business afloat, going through the memories that the body provides, Azoth is kind of shocked at the shady shit Oliver has pulled in the past. Yeah, I would say he probably had lawsuits like these already and kind of relied on things like oh they just used it incorrectly and it's not meant for long-term use and all that jazz as azoth sits there thinking about these things and rifling through oliver's memories a, a low hum starts at the edge of his hearing and it gets more and more intense very slowly and eventually he recognizes it as the buzzing of locusts and flies And the moment he focuses on it, it silences. But Azoth remembers that sound. He remembers it well. That was one of the things that he heard as he rose from the pit. He 
he's just going to sit there, not doing much of anything for a few minutes, trying to like catch the sound of guard, you know, faking not being attentive while he just tries to focus on pretty much everything. Um, the lights around him, the windows, the sound of Oliver's uh, body, you know, the blood in his veins, his breathing. The sound doesn't come back, but there is a faint chill that crawls across Oliver's back, up his spine, across his shoulders, and it settles in the back of his skull. It feels suspiciously like the touch of the abyss. And with that, we will turn to Lily. Lily arrives home, and her home, if I recall correctly, is very well appointed, Lily being the wealthy woman that she is. Very much so. There is, of course, a stack of mail waiting for her. Thankfully, all of it looks like standard fare, bills, flyers, junk mail. Nothing really stands out. There is a you know, bill from the daycare. There's a bill from the attorneys. But aside from that, nothing piques her interest. The house is, as noted, well appointed. The maid is just finishing up for the day as Lily walks in. Oh, hello, Miss Lily. Just finishing. Ah, thanks. Thanks, thanks. Great work, by the way. Oh, thank you. We'll see you next weekend. Of course. Bye. Bye, Miss Lily. And she hustles out the door. There's sort of an eerie quiet that settles over the house with the maid's absence. Abathar starts to think unbidden about the pitter-patter of little feet and how empty the house seems without them. And through Lily, a moment of depression sets in. Abathar finds himself missing Lily's daughter, like a dull ache. She's with Ron now, isn't she? The ex-husband, yes. Yeah, that's his name. Yeah, Abathar will probably, like, maybe sit at his work desk, you know, do sort of start taking the bills, looking at them, you know, uh, getting ready to pay them one by one. And after Abathar is done with this, uh, he she goes and gets a bottle of wine, something from the cellar, opens it up, you know, has a glass, maybe even like... I'd say Lily would have a fireplace at her home. Oh, yes, absolutely. As she settles in with her wine and her fire, about two glasses in, suddenly Abathar finds himself in the chambers of a fortress during the war. It's not wine in his hand anymore. It's a letter detailing provisions of troops and how they aren't receiving enough food or water. The war has turned against the rebels. A downcast human soldier stands by the door, a pleading look in his eyes, a satchel of scrolls hanging from his shoulder. His armor is pitted, worn, tarnished, and dented, but his sword is polished and hangs comfortably at his side. Abathar reads carefully the list and understands that the logistics of the situation are against him and his allies. The soldier shuffles his feet slightly. My my lord, what do you suggest we do? Our foragers return with nothing, and there is a cloud of locusts on the horizon, coming closer day by day. What few provisions we have left will surely be decimated. Leave me to my chambers and bring vessels for water. Yes, Lord. And retrieve them every evening henceforth, and do not disturb me otherwise. The soldier shuffles out and closes the door behind him, and the chamber becomes very quiet. The shadows seem to lengthen unnaturally as time passes. Abathar blinks and stretches and finds himself back on Lily's couch in front of the fireplace. The phone is ringing. Abathar lets it ring for a while, but then he goes and reluctantly picks it up. Right as he picks it up, the answering machine clicks on. Lily speaking, you hear your body say, Lily, where have you been? I'm sorry, who is this? Are you you kidding me? Our daughter has been wondering where the hell you've been all day. She's supposed to be with you. You completely forgot, didn't you? Did I? As in out of character, did I? (laughs) Out of character, you don't think so. Yeah, okay. Remember the party... 
You were supposed to be there? I No, she's with you. What are you talking about? Yeah, she's with me, but we were supposed to be at the party together. What party? What are you talking about? The birthday party. Her cousin, remember? You didn't tell me about that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. No, I'm pretty sure you didn't. Yeah, whatever. You know, you were supposed to be here. You weren't. Our daughter is devastated. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks. Click. Time for more wine. (sighs) Lily reluctantly goes back and sits in her chair (sighs) and uh, probably finishes her wine, honestly, and douses the fire. And the next thing she's going to do is go to a window and try to conjure up a rainfall with the Lord of the Storms. <laughs> uh, you know what? I will give it to you. But given that it's January, it starts off as rain for a brief moment and then very quickly becomes sleet. Yeah. And then snow and sleet mixed. And for a while, you know, Lily just watches it or Abathar. And it's just reminiscing about, you know, the war and or trying to reminisce, you know, try to sort of see if he remembers anything else. Really thinking on the war, looking out at the sleet and the snow as they fall, Lily gets a brief flash, or Abathar rather, gets a brief flash Humans, mortal soldiers, in various liveries, liveries, however you pronounce it, huddled around fires underneath tents, shivering in a brutal cold, a dry cold, but brutal all the same. The few angels doing what they can to warm them individually, drive away and shield them from the sleet and hail that is falling outside the Dome of Protection, which seems almost to be of divine provenance. The last few pieces of meat being passed around, provisions running exceptionally low, water being the only thing in abundance, some last few scraps of cheese and vegetation being chewed on by certain individuals. And then Abathar finds himself standing at Lily's window again, staring out over the streets and the lights, And it's just cold and very lonely. Well, I think after this, Lily's going to call and call it a night earlier. Oh, hello again, folks. I'd like to tell you about the Facebook group we run called White Wolf and Onyx Path RPGs Gameplay and Media. Have you ever wished you could have an easy way to find gameplay videos and podcasts or just media in general that deals with your favorite White Wolf role-playing games? Or have you ever wished you could find a forum to share gameplay that you have recorded? One that won't be drowned out by random posts and discussions so that your media could get the attention you deserve. The group is specifically run with the sole intent of being a one-stop shop for people to view or share media involving the games we all love. We take thorough steps to ensure the page does not become cluttered and is easy to traverse. The group is already immense and continuing to rapidly grow, with new media being shared every day. Stop on by. We hope to see you there.